the beat. I think a lot of people um, wonder why a drummer is playing what it is that he's playing. And in common with all languages, and I think drumming is a language, uh, you'll probably find letters with which you make up words, with which you make up phrases and then sentences. And before you know it, you're talking to people. But until you know the letters or the vowel sounds for the language, then it's, um, it's very hard to communicate and drummers Funnily enough, have what is known as 26 drum rudiments, which are the basic building blocks of drumming. And by coincidence, there are 20 letters in, 26 letters in the alphabet as well. Um, and from these rudiments, it's, um, it's possible to start making your sentences. And I think practicing these rudiments is a bit like scales on a piano. As I'm playing, I can kind of see the notes going past. If I want to, I can monitor the notes going past, as it were, in my brain's eye. Um, and I would imagine that life from a drummer who can't see that and has no sense of the tonic chord in the piece he's working with, or has any simple understanding of you know, a tonic, and a, a five and a four and a one chord sequence, is, it would be very, very different. I can't really imagine it. Um, I like to feel I know what's going on in the other instruments, so I could probably play the, the parts that the other musicians have and know how the music fits together. I think this, this helps you in designing your own drum part for the piece in question. I don't really like the way I hold the drumsticks very much. I think uh, it looks to me when I see myself drumming always as though I'm only just holding onto the drumsticks. It looks like a very light grip. And in fact, it is. I think particularly my left stick, I picked it up wrong when I was a kid and stayed with a kind of a bad habit. What happened then was that I started playing with musicians with electric instruments and there were no microphones on the drums. And I couldn't make my main beat in the left stick heard very clearly. So instinctively, I started to get the higher frequencies out of the snare drum, which you do by getting a rim shot. So mostly, I play because of that fault, um, I play off the rim of the drum now for the louder strokes, which gives me a, a fairly individual snare drum sound, which people are always asking about, you know, why does Bill Booth's snare drum sound like this? And it's simply because I hit it in a certain way, because I had a rather weak left stick grip. I think the moral behind this story is that sometimes your faults can be turned to good advantage, that a musician is uh, the total not only of his good things, but of his faults too. And uh, when you can understand your faults, live with them, and turn them to creative use, then I think that can be, that can be of interest. The, uh, the pragmatic side of it is that I had to play to audiences. They had to hear me. There were no microphones on the drums. I had to cut through a band, and that's why I sound the way I do. Well, that was his mainly distinctive thing, of course, is the old Bruford snare drum, which I think used to be the engineer's, you know, studio engineer's nightmare. It was like, ah, how do you, how'd you do that? But of course, he always got it through, and especially with Eddie in the early days. But Bill's a very, um, uh, he's not a greedy musician, you know. When, like when we're mixing, he was, he was into his own dimension. But when I look back, sometimes the drums are actually quite quiet. And yet, they still have effect. In other words, they were, they were in a very good perspective because of the way he played, not, not necessarily because of the way it was mixed. I could break down soloing for you into, into two or three rough sort of categories which would give me raw material from which I would then play. Um, and I would elect on different nights to do different things uh, from perhaps these categories. Uh, a, a, a big category is, are you going to keep a steady pulse in the solo? 
and then embroider on top on the one hand, or are you going to dispense with steady metrical pulse altogether and improvise short sentences which may or may not float well, will ho hopefully will flow together, but have no set metrical pulse. You could, there's a, a simple decision that you could choose between there. Then again, you might opt for a kind of call and response thing, which is more textural, so that on the, let's say, the heavy acoustic armament in the kit, perhaps the gong drum and the rototom and the snare drum and the acoustic bass drum, you can set up master drummer figures, as it were. Uh, this would be African, really, where the master drummer states the phrase and the chorus of drums then answer. Another interesting thing about soloing is that it can be your research and development period of the evening. You know, I feel I can play uh, very risky ideas to an audience um, in a solo, and I'm doing something on the drums, which I'm hoping the group will pick up on and be able to use in its music. I quite often offer textures, particularly from the drums in drum solos, uh, that I would like to be playing behind the rest of the group. Um, accepted it. I haven't quite figured out how the rest of the group can play on top of these things yet. But I'm sort of offering them. You see what I mean? It's kind of a research and development time for me, a drum solo. things started going really was in 68, 69, there was a big explosion of, uh, of musicians entering the so-called rock field at that time, post Sgt. Pepper. You know, it just felt that after Sgt. Pepper anybody could do anything in, uh, in music and it just seemed that the, the wilder the idea, musically, the better, but it had just better work kind of thing. Anything seemed up for grabs. What comes to mind when uh, we're, we're talking about Bill influencing my playing is that uh, there's, there's something in Siberian Coutreau that, uh, that was a riff of Bill's that I think is in 5-4 that I always really liked. And when I used to play it, I always used to look, look at him. And then, of course, I also played it with Alan. But I always thought about Bill when I was playing because it was one of those things, like his sort of tricks that he used to like to do. 
As far as Yes was concerned, I felt that, that uh, after a, a popular album we did called Close to the Edge, that had taken a lot of time, um, I really didn't feel I wanted to go that particular pathway anymore. That I could see myself writing my own licks, you know, I could see myself creating my own little prison cell in which I was going to play for the rest of my days if I wasn't careful. And I wanted the, the next best thing to a musical cold shower, really, which was going in Robert Fripp's King Crimson at the time. That was black to white. If Yes was black, so King Crimson was white, or if Yes was a white kind of A major, diatonic, sunny kind of vocal group, King Crimson was nasty, it was a minor key playing band. The emphasis in King Crimson was always on playing and what you could do with the texture of the music rather than presenting some kind of a vocal entertainment, which is more what more what Yes was. And King Crimson, for better or for worse, was one of the, the few kind of improvising electric rock bands at that stage. I don't, mind, I don't mean that the guitarist took endless solos. I mean that it collectively tried to improvise in a freeform style. Bill has a remarkable amount of energy. He's a straightforward, honest, enthusiastic professional musician who should have lost his enthusiasm and turned into cynicism years ago. He's the only man I know who would be prepared to abandon nearly everything he's worked for and earned as a musician and start again. Music is for me very often a mirror which, which you can hold up and you can see how you behave all the time in music. Uh, music never lies to you, it's, it's, it's just you and a passive instrument which is fascinating. And there all the time is the mirror and you may not like what it is that it reflects back. Quite often you're appalled at your own behaviour. You know, and you would wish to make some changes in your own personality. Sometimes good ideas for rhythmic and uh, musical lines come straight from practice. You may have been practicing by rearranging the notes somewhat, by maybe writing what you're practicing and rearranging the notes somewhat. It's not a, it's not a long step to... First thing I do with that is put it on two sound sources. For the sake of argument, we'll say I don't know what that is just now. But in fact, it turns out, having written it down, that it's a 17-note line. It won't occur happily over a 4-4 beat, but it will appear to resolve itself after a certain number of bars. I can hear 
the thing starting to kind of dance and to lilt a bit, and already I'm beginning to get ideas for what kind of a melody line might go with that. Um, it might even be nicer if we add another tone color, says he producing his, his uh, kind of westernized version of an African slit drum. Same thing exactly. faster perhaps in tempo. Maybe we could even split the accents between two other drums here. That sounds quite nice. It's, um, it's, it's liquid, which I like the texture of it. Um, the 4-4 four, four foot, the basic pulse in the foot, keeps the dance beat going. At no time should that feel be disrupted. It has a lot of rhythmic complexity, but yet uh, the, the accents are sufficiently complex not to feel a sense of repetition until after a long time. It feels random, but it isn't. As I play between the drums and with the random, um, imprecisely tuned log drum, I'm beginning to hear rhythms, the sort of thing a bass player might do. And uh, this, in fact, turned up on a King Crimson LP and is the rhythm and bass track for a tune called Discipline. From Bill's point of view, or rather from my point of view working with Bill in it, one of the, the best things about it is the African slip drum. It's so limiting for me to play with cymbals, playing 16s. They're taking all my accents. But in terms of the slip drum, the timbre is such that it doesn't get in my way. It, it chatters away comfortably. It gives me all the space I need for working around it. Discipline is, as it says on the album cover, uh, not an end in itself, only a means to an end. 
within the piece itself, the, the guitars are mainly working in fives, which is an entirely natural time signature for a Bulgarian folk singer, but not for an American folk singer who would essentially be working in rock and roll. But since I'm European, I have no, uh, or rather I have considerable interest in, in using part of the musical culture of Europe. Sometimes in tunes, um, I think the drummer is, and will want to be simple and complex at the same time. So that um, if there is an odd numbered rhythm, perhaps a, a 17 or some, some trickier beat like that, which half of the orchestra has, it may be best to offset that with a steady 4-4 <clears throat> <clears throat> pulse, so that the audience locates the dance groove in it, locates the simple, essential beat, from which it then perceives the tension of the odd number on top. If you merely present the odd number against nothing, there is no tension, and therefore excitement. Excitement in music comes from tension and release. Um, if you merely offer the complex beat, uh, people tend to uh, only perceive it as a complex beat. If you offer the simple at the same time, there is the tension, there is the excitement, there is music. A gig itself, a live performance, is really the, the cream, it's the tip of the iceberg. It's all the work underneath, in a way, that's kind of more important. Um, when you're playing a live performance, you're more or less presenting prepared material. There might be some improvising, there might not, in different ratios, but you're pre presenting something fairly prepared, even if it's just the 12 years worth of work you've put into music up until that moment. Um, and so I think the gig, uh, the gig is fun. I think it should be fun. I think you should actually enjoy playing. You must enjoy playing um, and not worry too much about it um, at that stage, whether you're a good drummer or a bad drummer or anything else like that. You must um, be at ease with yourself, I think, and realize that this now is as good a musician as you are. There's nothing you can do about it. There's no point in getting nervous. Um, simply relax and enjoy playing. And I think that enjoyment uh, will communicate itself to an audience. I don't think you have to ham it up. I don't think you have to overact. I don't think you have to pose uh, for an audience in any way. I think they can see very clearly whether you're feigning or acting. And uh, simple enjoyment of the music is far and away the best kind of, uh, best remedy for all colds.